ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to be here. Thanks to I on Earth uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I am Dr. Abedrame, uh, working with Enda Energy, an uh, international NGO, uh, member of uh, uh, Enda Says the World. Uh, I work uh, with them since uh, some years. Uh, contact me if you want to know the exact time. <laughs> uh, Enda uh, has been working on three real conventions since the beginning in 1992. Uh, I am so pleased to be able to introduce the chair of this session, Environmental Convention Index, measuring the implementation of the Global Environmental Convention. Professor uh, Maria Ivanova, she holds a PhD uh, and two master's degrees in international and environmental management from Yale University. Her current work focus on performance on international institutions, implementation of international environment agreements, and sustainability in organization. She is professor of global governance at the John McCorney Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies. And she is director of the Center for Governance and Sustainability at the University of Manchester, Boston. Maria. It's really a pleasure to, to see all of you here this, uh, this morning. We had a wonderful uh, start to, to the day in, uh, in the room next door with a discussion on on data and data for policy. I will now take us into the policy world and show you the data we produce for policymakers about how countries are implementing their international obligations under the conventions. And uh, it, it really is an honor to share the, the podium today with, uh, with my colleagues, with Natalia escobar Berti, who is going to come up in, uh, in a few minutes. And uh, I'm very proud because Natalia was my first PhD student and is now a professor at Universidad de Aviv in Colombia. And I was just saying in the room next door, this is what professors do. We clone ourselves. And we continue to do that over time. And when you produce more professors, they clone themselves. And so it's a really this upward spiral of a positive cloning. And then we will have uh, Hadi Bisse from uh, UN Environment, who is our, our partner in, uh, in this project on uh, uh, assessing the implementation of international environmental obligations. And uh, then we will have Peter Katanisa, the advisor to the Environment Minister of Rwanda, uh, who is our other partner in, in this project, as Rwanda has uh, requested us to analyze and assess their performance on the environmental conventions. And we will be going on to the Ramsar Convention uh, tomorrow to present the results on Ramsar's implementation, on uh, Rwanda's implementation of the Ramsar Convention. But today, we will share with you the big picture of this work that that we have been doing, what we call the Environmental Conventions Index. And it will touch upon all of the conventions that, that we are analyzing. And uh, you will hear about the relevance at the international level uh, from UN Environment's perspective and the relevance of this data at the national level from Rwanda's perspective. And this is not moving. Okay, we have had these issues with, with freezing PowerPoints, but okay, I need to click right there. Excellent. So the 
the problem that we are setting out to address in this is what we're also familiar with. We have environmental issues, environmental concerns, they pose threats to, to human security, and we have created responses in global governance, which usually are in the form of conventions or multilateral environmental agreements in various areas. You often will hear from professors in this field that we have over 1,000 global environmental agreements. And yes, that's true. You can see the upward mobility of uh, the growth of, of, these, uh, of these agreements since the 1970s when the United Nations Environment Program was, was established. Uh, but most of them are at a bilateral level. There are about 10 to 15 really global conventions, and uh, their membership has expanded also quite significantly, and they include almost all United UN uh, member states. Uh, they have universal membership. For our purposes here, we look at them into uh, several main clusters. In biodiversity, with the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, the Convention on Migratory Species, and the Convention on Biological Diversity. In chemicals, we have two main conventions as of now, but we, we now have also the Minamata Convention, but we have not measured its implementation because it has countries have not implemented it as, as of yet. So for our index at the moment, we look at the Basel Convention on the movement of hazardous waste, the Stockholm Convention on persistent organic pollutants. In atmosphere, we have climate and ozone. In land, uh, the uh, UN Convention on uh, Combating Desertification, and uh, the World Heritage Convention, which is under UNESCO, which protects both natural sites and cultural sites. So in, in our sense, in, in the US, we often put it together with the Biodiversity Conventions when we look at the protection of natural sites. So to circle back to that problem statement, then we do establish these international mechanisms that we hope will resolve the environmental issues they were supposed to, to address. But we have the issue of their implementation and their effectiveness. When we talk about implementation, we don't know to what extent countries actually implement the obligations that they signed up to. We were quite surprised by that finding as, as an academic institution because there's a lot of writing that, oh, countries do not implement the convention. Or, no, most countries implement most of conventions most of the time, or most of international law most of the time. And then when we try to figure out, well, how much do they actually implement, there is no quantitative assessment of the extent of implementation, much less than of the effectiveness. Do those conventions actually resolve the problems that they were designed to address? And so this, this is what we set out to do with the creation of this Environmental Implementation Index. Before we can measure effectiveness, we actually have to measure, is that policy, are those obligations actually being implemented? If so, then what is the result on the ground? So that's our ultimate goal, is to measure effectiveness. But at this morning, I saw we can do that when we couple our index on the level of implementation with the data cube that was, that was discussed in, in the room uh, next door this morning and all of that geospatial data about the results on the ground. So in a sense, we're trying to address several gaps. One was the, is the conceptual gap to focus on implementation and how it links to effectiveness. But second is the empirical gap. We, we don't have, we have, until now, we haven't had enough data to show whether countries are implementing what they have signed up to do. And then a methodological gap. Whenever that is available, it's usually for one country or for a few countries 
we do not have a large end data set. And this is what we, we set out to do a few years ago um, when a colleague from the UN Environment Program came to us and said, could you assess the effectiveness of multilateral environmental agreements? So yes, sure, we'll do. And what happened is that Natalia made this her dissertation. So to all of you who are professors in the audience, I want to say that when we have these fantastic, amazing research questions, they usually can turn into uh, a dissertation and then the lifetime's work of someone. And so now Natalia will, will come and talk about the research questions and the methodology and some of the results across these, these conventions walk us through these findings and then we'll, we'll hear about their international significance and the national application. Okay. Thank you, Maria, and thank you all for being uh, here today. Uh, as Maria was mentioning, uh, the question of implementation was largely uh, understudied in terms of the empirical analysis and the number of countries that were or that are currently part of many of these agreements. So that's why we went task of trying to assess that level of implementation and designing an empirical indicator that allows us to understand country dynamics and also use that as a foundation to understand why countries perform differently to figure out the reasons at a, the country level at the institutional level and also in terms of the different environmental problems that may affect the extent to which countries are, are fulfilling their international environmental obligations. So when we uh, figure out these questions and try to understand uh, the conventions that we were going to study, we found that uh, not all the conventions have the necessary uh, standard uh, sources of data for the analysis of the implementation question. As I was going to, I'm going to explain in a minute, we are using the national reports that the countries submit to all these agreements. But those national reports only have a standard consistent structure with similar reporting templates and a, an established frequency on the process of national reporting for four of those agreements. So that's why the data that, uh, or the results that I'm going to show you corresponds only to four of those MEAs uh, that we mentioned before, the Basel and the Stockholm Convention in Chemicals and uh, the Ramsar Convention and CITES in the Biodiversity Cluster. So to tell you a little bit about uh, the process that we have for the methodology, we basically went and tried to uh, understand the structure of those national reports. National reports have uh, different uh, formats for questioning the countries about the extent they are fulfilling their obligations. Uh, those questions uh, are connected to different, the different elements that are established in the agreements, the different articles and obligations that the countries have established. And we found that in terms of uh, questions, all the conventions have a different number. Uh, the case that is probably a more uh, insightful is that of the Ramsar Convention because they have managed to uh, work with member states in fulfilling reports that used to have more than 570 questions back in 2005. So the structure of these reports is very different and tells a lot about the detail in which the conventions are engaging their member states to understand the fulfillment of their obligations. And also we can see here, I hope that this is working, we can see here how uh, the reporting templates have changed through time, trying to reflect new obligations, trying to reflect uh, changes in the conventions and being more detailed in terms of the uh, process of implementation. Right now, we are in the process of coding all the reports for the Ramsar COP that, as Maria was saying, is taking place here in Dubai as we speak. And for that, we are going to find that that number of 92 questions went up again into about 150 questions that 
try to be more detailed, also asking uh, the connection between the obligations of on the Ramsar Convention and their contribution to the SDGs. So once we had identified all those questions, we tried to determine which indicators did they measure. We established like the base of the indicators that the conventions analyze and we classify them in five categories because we believe that the process of implementation has some common trends within it. There are some some indicators that are financial and measure how the conventions manage the resources, how the member states, sorry, manage the resources for their implementation. Others have to do with information, with the institutions that they establish. So we have a general category uh, on that because it also allows us to figure out in which aspects some countries are being more successful than others. For example, if a country uh, has been very successful in putting together the legislation to implement its obligations, but it still needs to work on everything that is information related. So for the four conventions, we're going to find uh, also a different number of indicators. And from there, we define uh, specifically the uh, definition of those. We have here some examples on how questions measure specific indicators and refer to the different obligations that we're talking about. Uh, the existence of a nat national wetland policy, for example, in the case of Ramsar, is a good example of how the countries need to decide and to define a specific a strategic instruments to advance on the process of implementation. And for each of those questions, we found how the countries report data. Many of the questions that we analyze are multiple choice questions, so it is possible to assess specifically the extent to which the countries are moving on on the process of implementation. So we establish a scoring scale from zero to five to determine based on each question's answer uh, the progress of the country in the level of implementation where Zero means that there's no response, once means that there's no implementation, and five means a uh, full implementation. And we have different examples across the specific indicators here for you to see the difference because all the questions have a uh, different specific scales. But at the end of the day, we had like the structure to move from the information on the national reports to a standardized indicator that allows for comparisons across conventions and uh, within them as well and across countries uh, to some extent. So we did a process of coding of those national reports and based on the scoring of reported data we have like the index uh, scores. Uh, so far, uh, we have analyzed data for uh, 198 countries, 193 member states of the United Nations, plus four observers and the European Union. We have analyzed up around 2,800 reports that are equivalent to 75,000 data points and uh, about 25,000 additional data points on information from the reports that does not necessarily relate to a specific measures of implementation, but provides important uh, analysis in terms of the issues that affect the process of implementation. What does this mean? We code data that has to do with the kind of assistance that the countries get from international organizations, the challenges that they have on the process of implementation, some of the elements from the nature of the reports. So all those processes provided like a very uh, substantive uh, database that goes from 2001 to 2015 that is currently being expanded until 2018 and that talks about uh, the process of reporting also as an important issue. And uh, in partnership with UN Environment, we have been working also on some qualitative case studies from selected countries around the world. Uh, we did a, a project that Hadi will tell you more about that uh, in a minute with uh, 10 countries around the world. And we're currently working with Rwanda as well to connect the process that we have on the index and the analysis on implementation with actual policies and evaluations from uh, different organizations in the field about how 
the different obligations are being implemented. So just to give you a sense of our findings, I'm going to talk uh, about three different categories of data. What we found in terms of membership that is pretty straightforward, but gives us a sense of uh, how that process has evolved about the results in terms of national reporting, because it proved to be a separate issue on itself. And uh, last but not least about uh, the elements in terms of implementation. In the membership of the conventions, as we uh, mentioned before, they all of, almost all of them have universal membership. The Ramsar Convention is the one with uh, the least number of countries in this group of four, but it has 169 member states. So in all the cases, we have an important uh, a number of countries uh, that are listed there. Uh, and we know from this analysis that we're having like the kind of a uh, coverage that we want for the countries however when we went to collect that original data source of the national reports we found a, an obstacle and we found an analysis that proved to be relevant on itself the use of the national reports and the structure of the national reports is a critical factor in understanding this process of implementation and we found first that countries don't report as often as they are supposed to. The average rate of national reporting for the agreements, as explained here, goes from 38% for CITES to 86% to Ramsar. So it's very interesting uh, to see this because uh, the question is what makes country report to one convention and not to the other if they are member of, members of both. And uh, talking with representatives from the secretariat, from representatives from uh, many member states, we have found that there's a, there are issues that are relevant in terms of the use of that information and how that contributes to different processes. If we put this in terms of a compliance analysis, it's very clear that uh, in some cases, countries have never reported to the conventions that they are members to, and that uh, the rate of submission of the national reports has definitely gone down in some of the agreements so the process of national reporting needs to be like an issue of attention in terms of uh, working with the member states in producing the necessary reports to assess implementation because that's the source of data and of information that the convention secretariats have for the analysis of implementation and that other actors as universities can also use on that process. And moving into the index scores, this is the, these are the results that we have uh, for our analysis. As we can see here, there's definitely a important uh, way to go in terms of implementation. Even though countries and uh, conventions are making progress on this front, there are still uh, factors in which they need to work to uh, move forward with implementation but what is more interesting that having just a score for each of the agreements is how countries compare within each of them so if we talk about developed versus developing countries we found that there is a difference between the chemical conventions and the biodiversity agreements in the chemical conventions developed countries definitely perform better and that talks about the importance of technology capacity building and the chemicals assessment mechanisms that some developed countries have and that a high technical level of the chemical management definitely it's an obstacle for developing countries to advance on that process while for biodiversity there's practically no significant difference and that also talks about the importance of biodiversity resources for developing countries and other factors on that analysis and if we put this at the regional level we are going to find uh, those similarities as well. In the biodiversity cluster, there's not that many gaps across the different regions. Uh, Australia and New Zealand perform very well for the Ramsar Convention. That's why they are on top of the list. And for the chemical conventions, the regions that have uh, the most important gaps come from Africa, from uh, the Pacific small island developing states and also from some countries in Asia. So that's 
uh, summarizes like the regional approach and we have the possibility of offering this type of data for the analysis, including every country that has submitted at least one report to the agreements. So the analysis of individual countries reflects on important trends for countries and for conventions. As you can see here for the Basel Convention, there is, import, there is an important number of countries that has positive scores, but there's also challenges in some countries like Burkina Faso or a, a chat that are still struggling with the level of implementation. <laughs> and for the Stockholm Convention, uh, there is more challenges in terms of implementation, but also an important absence of national reports in all the countries that show here in gray. The analysis of top performers clearly reflects that importance of development for the implementation of the chemicals conventions. As you can see here, all the top performers for the Basel Convention are developed countries with some uh, different uh, approach to the process, while bottom performers are uh, developing countries to some extent. Ramsar, on the other side, has a more uh, average performance across the different agreements. And when we analyzed the top performers, we found that eight of them are developing countries and four of them are located in Africa. So we have the opportunity there to work with these countries in understanding their process of implementation and uh, moving forward with the different obligations uh, that they have. And last in this analysis is the case of CITES in which we have a completely different story because of uh, the lack of reporting that is a critical issue for the analysis of uh, the convention. All this data is available for consultation uh, directly through us and hopefully will be available in a website uh, earlier next year. So all the countries and the organizations that are working with them in analyzing the process of implementation and in supporting uh, these environmental obligations can get a sense on how these policies are being implemented it also it's also very interesting in the case of countries that are providing development assistance for the uh, developing countries to move forward with this process and see how they connect and also uh, the move from here is to connect this process of implementation with effectiveness data as maria was mentioning before to see how the implementation of these obligations definitely connects with uh, the solution of the environmental problems and response to the role of the agreements as governance instruments. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Maria. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. And um, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, as you have seen, Maria has given you the, the global picture of how the Environmental Convention Index came into place. And Natalia had walked us through what they are really doing as a as a, as a team herself and uh, and Maria and all the students who were working on the index. Um, um, we call it effectiveness implementation of MEAs normally, um, but we were as a new executive director, we are not allowed to use a lot of acronyms now. That's why we call it now National Implementation of Global Environmental Agreements. Um, um, just a brief overview of what happened um, in 2015-16, um, um, uh, the Center of Governance in, in the University of Massachusetts, Boston, in partnership with UN Environment Law Division, um, commissioned a death study to really implement, um, analyze the effective implementation of MEAs, most of them administered by UN Environment. Um, uh, we had 10 countries then. Um, the countries were Algeria, Argentina, Australia, Canada, Colombia, Czech Republic, Germany, Mozambique, the Republic of Korea, and Thailand. The objective of the project were as follows, as it is to identify the level of implementation across countries and conventions, 
um, Natalia in her grass, she, she, she explained that very well, explained the factors that enable or challenge the implementation in different national contexts. She did that as well, some like we see the developed countries and the developing countries. The, the, the 10 countries were divided like that. We have five developed and five developing countries. And we've seen that um, the enabling factors were different from the developed and the developing countries. Um, track the extent to which the problems were being solved. She did explain that. Um, evaluate policy responses, identify the best practices, um, capacity needs, and promote learning. Um, we, we've seen that, and uh, we have expanded on number four. Um, that's why we have Rwanda as a new partner, because they have some best practices to show in effective implementation of some of these MEAs that are called in their national development agenda. And number five is to empower the stakeholders to engage in promoting implementation and enhancing effectiveness. Um, the next slide is the work we do in supporting countries implementing MEAs and the importance of this, that's the, the Environmental Convention Index helps us to enhance this. Um, in the middle, we, like the mandate of the UN environment, we are divided into divisions and divisions are divided into, we have branches and units. And in our division, we are the law division. Um, our mandate includes the international environmental governance and MEAs like the multilateral environmental agreements. So now you see the different, the different facets that we use daily in our work. I'm the focal point of um, chemicals and waste in our division. And I have other colleagues who work on biodiversity and other colleagues who work on, on cross-cutting issues as well. <laughs> the next slide as well takes us through the mandate we have and the importance of data to achieve this mandate from the organizational point of view to the divisional point of view and how we do it through the countries. Because when you see what we have, these are all our mandates that we, are, we have the Rio Plus 20, paragraph 88, 89, the future we want. Uh, we have some UNIA resolution. UNIA is the United Nations Environment Assembly Resolution 1 slash 11 and 2 slash 5 on the UN system wide coherence. And uh, I drew a line in between because the first two are the, 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 the international mandates that we have. The, the rest of the things, um, the rest of the four points um, gives an overview of how we, we daily interact with the MEAs that are administered by us. The other ones like, for example, Ramsar Convention right now, it's not a UN convention, but we have a strong cooperation with them. In fact, we have a MOU with Ramsar Convention right now. The next slide is a cooperation on enhanced implementation and enforcement of MEAs. This again is uh, talking mainly on the mandate of the law division on governance and improving the effective implementation on MEAs. I will not go into it, but um, if anybody is interested in it, I can go in them later one by one. <laughs> Mainstreaming SDGs in conventions, what we are working on in effective delivery of the environmental dimension of the 2030 agenda, the importance of data. As well, we have like two, four, six, I have eight pointers here, <clears throat> which are like further developed. I have, I can explain all of them one by one, how we're using them to, and all of them, all the list here, we see that the importance of data daily is getting more and more prominent on how we can use it to, 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 to deliver the environmental dimension of the 2030 agenda. Um, as you know, we have some indicators um, that we are responsible for that we developed under the clusters of the biodiversity and the chemical and waste as well. And these are um, the responsibility given by the, as mandated by the high level political forum as well. Um, we have colleagues here from the science division and, and we have UN life, UN, it was called UNEP life. Now it's called UN environment life. UNEP life um, <clears throat> strengthened the data 
an indicator framework for monitoring and reporting on environmental dimension of the SDGs. And um, the UN and the UN UNEP Life, we call it. And go through my notes. It's divided into three categories. Um, the main categories are our work as the UN Environment on Statistics. The, the next one is our work on uh, methodology development. When we say methodology development, um, we mean and data compilation. It spans across UN environment. Um, we have mainly science division, ecosystem division, and law division. Um, uh, when the, the 2015, uh, 2030 agenda and SDGs were commissioned, we did a mapping. For myself, I did a publication on um, mapping the chemical and waste um, MEAs uh, with the SDGs on all 17 goals and their indicators. Um, other colleagues did the same thing with all the conventions, especially in the biodiversity convention. And that formed the basis of, uh, we invited the science division and they, they, they were very thrilled that this can form a basis of an initial step on forming and on, on getting indicators and data on the, on the indicators that we are responsible for. Um, yeah, um, we have the, uh, again, uh, some of our work span into, we have the uh, Informia. It's called the Knowledge Management Portal. It is run by the law division and uh, they are sitting in Geneva in our office, in the regional office. And as well, um, it's another important tool that we use um, data again and MEAs and uh, SDGs um, to showcase so many things. We've gone beyond what is stated on the slide. Right now we do courses. For example, Ramsar Convention was coming up. We developed courses on Ramsar Convention, show people you go and you do the course. It's a 45 minutes course. You do it, you issue a certificate and you know the different steps of how to do it. We have them on negotiation exercises. We have the COP decisions, we have treaties, we have, mostly it's a, it's a very interesting um, searchable engine that is, um, and we partner with a lot of MEAs, both, both the UN environment partners and uh, non-UN environment ad administered MEAs. The next slide about is our success, success cases and partnership. We build regional collaboration and capacity for national implementation. Rwanda best practicing best practices in selecting selected MEAs. Our speaker will come right now and tell you how we implement it on the ground. The South South cooperation in learning co cooperation learning exercises that we are doing, the triangular learning cooperation that we are doing in selected African countries and the collaboration of UN environment together with the government of Rwanda and the Center of Sustainability and Governance um, headed by Maria. Thank you very much. And uh, the next speaker, Peter, will get, put us through on the Rwanda experience and how they in, uh, um, intend to use the experience they got to, uh, for the rest of Africa. Montio. Uh, I thank uh, the first uh, who have Professor Maria, Natalia, and Hadi uh, for uh, the information they have shared with us. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Eye on Earth for this great opportunity. Um, when I received the invitation, the first thing I did, I ran and I looked at the website. What does I on Earth stands for? What does it do? And the first impression I had is that I thought about I on Earth and I said, imagine seven billion people, all their eyes on Earth, and they collaborate to find solutions to the global problems. How massive and interesting that would be. And I will say that if any country among the 193 countries, any of them were here, maybe to talk about their experiences in implementing 
the environmental conventions, each and every one of us will have some positive things to say and will have some maybe not good things to talk about. So I'm privileged among those countries to be here to talk about how we are trying to implement the global uh, multilateral environmental conventions. Um, and just to go direct to the what, uh, sorry, it's not working. Uh, well, what I'm going to put here is uh, to share with you, it's just to facilitate uh, discussions. And maybe because if you look at the picture of how we are doing in terms of implementing global conventions, it's not all that a very good picture. There is, everywhere there is improvement, we can do some improvement. So I'll look at, first of all, I think some of you, uh, when you think, when they talk about Rwanda, you'll ask yourself, where is this country? Where is, in which continent? So I try to say, okay, that's a very, it's like a drop somewhere in Africa. And it's a small country, uh, but we are trying to survive other, other countries. And in fact, I will say that we are thriving right now. Uh, so a small country like that, I try to put this into context in terms of environmental management and dimensions. And facts, if you look at a very small country with 26 square kilometers, uh, and you say that 10.37% 10 10 of that country is fully protected according to the CBD uh, convention on uh, the indicator on full protection, uh, we have uh, more than four national parks. Uh, Rwanda is blessed with different landscape. We have the savanna, we have the Afro mountains, we have, uh, it's a hilly country. We have quite a very good climate. Uh, we tend to call ourselves that we experience eternal spring. Um, mostly hilly terrain, but prone to effects of climate change. So the only and the only choice we have is to be resilient, to try and look at both adaptation and mitigation measures for us. Just to give you one example that last year, Rwanda lost its citizen in landslides and floods to the tune of 246 people, citizens we lost last year on specifically natural disasters. So this is not something that is just somewhere there. It's within us and with, we are trying to see how to resolve these issues by uh, trying to work with all global partners to see that we contribute uh, how we manage and how we live better in this world. So um, if you look at uh, the country, as I've said, it's a hilly country with the highest pitch at that uh, above sea level. Uh, and the lowest point is at around, uh, which is the flood in the southwest of the country, it's 900 meters above sea level. So if you try to compare with where we are right now, the highest pitch in Dubai, it stands at 1,934 meters above sea level. So it's, that shows where we are versus where this country lies in terms of uh, the landscape. So, so Rwanda today, as I mentioned, sorry. Rwanda today, uh, I will say that we are a young nation in terms of governance, in terms of, um, uh, living in peace among each other. But I will say that we are coming from a country which was surviving to a country we can say that we are thriving now. 
And I hope that each and every nation in this world, they could all thrive in their own context, in their own regions. We know the challenges we are facing today in terms of global migrations. And one of the factors is climate change. If you manage well your countries, there's no need for you to move where you are to go to another country. So this is a very good example of when people decide or global citizens decide to live in peace with nature. We have one part of the country, which is the southern and the eastern part of the country. And during the genocide, we lost these two because of uh, human settlement. We had encroached on this park that half, past, half, part of the, half part of the park was lost. But with good policies, we have now managed to reintroduce among the big five for those who uh, animals of uh, lovers of uh, uh, animals and wildlife we have now we have into we introduced uh the lion in 2016 the same park and in 2017 we, we introduced the rhino so the same park now has the big five so in the context you can look in terms of population density i think minus Mauritius, we are the highest populated, populated country in Africa. So this also gives you a picture of where we are in terms of the challenges we are facing. So coming back to uh, Rwanda and implementing the environmental multilateral agreements, those are the multilateral agreement Rwanda is implementing up to today. So if you look at... Uh, when we started and when we ascended to this multilateral environment agreement, I think we are trying to do a good job in terms of trying to integrate these multilateral environment agreements and domesticate them into our national policies and programs for us to be able uh, to report in one area. And I think globally and nationally and regionally, you'll find that we all have challenges in terms of uh, providing, producing different reports and even coordination at national level among all those uh, international agreements, not only environmental agreements, but even other global conventions that countries are assigned to. So uh, how are we doing it? nationally uh, in terms of institutional and legal framework. So when we adopted the environment policy in 2003, we made sure that it was uh, paged on the international environmental convention agreements. So all the obligations, all the, the key issues that were identified by setting up this convention or developing these conventions were integrated into our environment policy. So that when we are implementing our policy, actually we are implementing the global environment conventions. And I think um, platforms like Eye on Earth with the key focus on data can be a critical input in national development process for countries because this is a good opportunity for us. Uh, we, in 2005, we, you can imagine, because we are trying to catch up with time, the law came after the policy. But it should be the other way around, right? So uh, we established an institution. REMA is the Rana Environment Management Agency, which is in charge of implementing the environment policy. Uh, then we have, in 2011, now we came up with uh, the policy or the strategy to implement uh, our environment policy. Uh, and if you look down, you look at different uh, policies that we have in place. So now, as we are talking about data, what's the importance of data and how is it 
uh, resonating with our country in terms of uh, investing in getting the real data to help us to implement our policies and programs. So data is crucial to measure the implementation of uh, multilateral environment agreements. And data which is collected can help to make and to inform timely decisions. Because we policymakers, for those of you who come out, have come from the side of the policymaking and implementation, any information which comes later is not going to be helpful for decision maker to make a decision. It has to be timely. So if it comes on time, it will be used by policymakers to help to implement the programs. Um, data availability is an asset in measuring and varying environment that leads to better decisions for growth and sustainable development. And having data helps in designing strategic programs that maximize the contribution of domesticated uh, multilateral environment agreements to economic growth while balancing the trade-offs. And existing data on mayors may inform national development plans. So best practices, how do we do it in Rwanda? Uh, uh, what can we share with the country, uh, with the world? First of all, is that effective national coordination of multilateral environment agreements, it's under one ministry. Uh, all those environment agreements, and they are imp being implemented by one agency which now has the mandate of mainstreaming this into other uh, economic development programs. Uh, integration of MEAs into national environment policy and its midterm strategic plan. Every after five years, we go back on the drawing board to look at how we are doing. And then also we try to evaluate the effectiveness of our programs in terms of uh, meeting the goals we have set for ourselves as a country. Then every productive sector, mainstream multilateral environment in relation to set national indicators and targets. So it's not all that a like, very good picture. There is where we are not uh, doing well and there is where we need support uh, in terms of uh, trying to understand really in details, uh, are we really effectively implementing our agreements? Are we really meeting the needs of our people. And I think uh, Professor Maria's work is very critical in helping us to at least address that issue with other support from other uh, countries and uh, partners. So we have limited data and resources to consistently plan long-term development and implementation process of uh, the MIAs. Then inadequate technical and multidisciplinary capacity. I think I really need to focus on the issue of multidisciplinary because when we talk about this, we need different capacities and skills to come together, to convene, to converge, and to collaborate. Like I on earth what you stand for. This is, uh, if you look at different people from science, from social economic, uh, they come together to address an issue. So I think we need to look more into the multidisciplinary capacity of countries to implement these uh, environment agreements. Limitation is in terms of agreeing on existing possible synergies among their implementation at national level. So we have to better also look at existing possible synergies at global level and national level. Then again, lack of smart performance indicators to measure at both national and global level. So, thank you. Uh, I leave you with this good picture. Uh, it's in a protected area and you can look at how pristine that environment is. So if we can be able to all aspire to have such natural ecosystems, we will achieve our multilateral environment agreement policy and implementation actions. Thank you so much. Why uh, do you 
you have any answer for that, please? Let's take a, a couple more questions and, and we'll, we'll get I have, I have more questions. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll take and, more and, questions and from more people. And the level of NGO involvement. Okay. How much the other countries? And about the MENA and NENA regions, you know, Middle East and North Africa, that are they really performed differently from okay. other parts of the world? Okay, that's a lot on that. that that's many three other questions, questions okay. you know, that, that Yes, we, we can talk over, over, over lunch. David and uh, then Jeff. Hi, I'm David Jensen, UN Environment. And this is for the first speaker. Um, you had the five categories. One of the categories, I think, was technical. Do you have a sense of, in that technical category, how many of those conventions actually require uh, reporting with spatial information about the particular theme of the convention? So, you know, in terms of like level of detection or the location of chemicals, you know, spatialized reporting. If you could get a sense on those requirements, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria, and thank you to all the speakers. Um, is there, in your opinion, Maria, um, reporting fatigue out there when it comes to governments reporting on dozens and dozens and dozens of conventions, global ones and regional ones and <laughs> ones as well. And um, the other aspect of that question is what are the convention secretariats doing to alleviate the reporting burden? Thank you. Yes. My question is related to Rwanda. Um, I think I like the concept of saying when we implement the environmental policy, the national policies, we are somehow implementing the US. But I wanted to know is your integration process, making sure that that is reflected in the US, is also reflected in the policies. Do you have a formal process to do that? How do you ensure that alignment? And maybe to the UN to say your training tools, are they customized to a point where one could make a conclusion that therefore environmental policies at a national level, because I understand the intention is more erroneous, but can I do the conclusion at a national level based on the two Thank you very much for your questions. Going to the question of performance, I think that there are factors at those that they conventional wisdom tells us that are affecting the level of implementation and the ways, like the results of the index. Definitely the level of development of the countries is a clear factor, especially in the chemicals convention. The details on uh, which factors associated to development can be analyzed with more specific indicators on that. What we want to use the index for is also to establish that relation between the a standardized measurement of implementation and other uh, national indicators that uh, reflect on that process. And another uh, issue that has definitely uh, been part of the findings is the nature of the problem. Biodiversity and chemicals uh, result in different processes of implementation. And we uh, have come to understand that in the nature of chemicals uh, and the chemical conventions addressing problems while the biodiversity conventions protect assets and, assets and protect natural resources. So there might be an issue there, but we can obviously talk more about those factors and about the extent to which NGOs play a role uh, there and can support uh, that process. In terms of the technical obligations, there are many. Uh, we refer to technical about the issues that are related to addressing the problem directly, like having inventories of uh, pollutants and uh, having like the technical analysis of the wetlands or having the necessary mechanisms for the trading and vector species. But the only one that, on our knowledge, uses spatial information is the wetlands because it's how we can establish and the convention has a very uh, robust a system of information based on that that definitely could use more technology on that and that also depends a lot on countries reporting on the state of their wetlands but they have a uh, made important progress on that and they are presenting uh, this week the global wetlands outlook that is supposed to offer more more data on that there is definitely reporting fatigue and uh, that's an issue that that we have been discussing with the secretary at the member states that we have uh, involved 
in the analysis of these results uh, towards uh, the implementation of the sustainable development agenda that becomes even more important. But uh, two of the advices to the secretariats will be to identify the information in the reports that is also relevant for the SDGs and uh, that's a, a factor in which the conventions can work together through UN environment on mainstreaming uh, sustainable development and on finding the kind of information that support those indicators. And uh, the other factor is the use of the information. Uh, we found that uh, when the focal points know that the data that they are producing on the reports is going to be used at the Secretariat uh, with some purpose, there is more commitment to that reporting process and, and they, when they get involved in the process of de developing the templates and figuring out the questions to answer and how those are going to be measured, there is definitely a result there and, and that would be uh, the main advice talking also about increasing reporting level. Uh, the fact that there is a close uh, follow-up from the process of reporting definitely contributes to that process and one of the goals of this project goes to that as well, to know the focal points that they, to let the focal points know that the information they are producing is being used for something. And if the, regardless of what happens with the level of implementation, if the project contributes to improve reporting as it has already happened in some cases, that definitely is, is a move forward uh, into the information on implementation and, and the, like Peter was saying, like the way in which uh, the countries are domesticating their international obligations. Thank you very much, Natalia. Um, in response to some of those questions, um, um, uh, why do countries perform differently? Um, she mentioned some, but um, when we go into countries, um, we, we discuss some reporting formatting and why do they report differently. And we realize that um, some of the challenges are very different, especially for developing countries. Um, you've seen if it is uh, online reporting, internet it's it's number one, number two power, number three um, 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 it's it's those are the basic, huh? um, but these are the things that are taken for granted in developed countries already. Um, but we find a, a focal point or a program officer who will tell you that I filled the form all the way to the point of sending power went on. Uh, and other human 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 resources challenges uh, within their offices. Um, NGO involvement, yes. There's NGO involvement because some of these, um, the projects we developed, um, they are in partnership with the national governments and the local NGOs, and they implement them. And some of those implementation of those uh, projects um, help them in answering those questions as a national, into their national reporting. Um, reporting fatigue, Jerry, yes. Um, yesterday we just discovered that in my country, Gambia, the report to Ramsa Convention, when Natalia opened it, it was blank. <laughs> yes, I mean, you, uh, there are so many reasons that we can we can advance towards that. Um, we've seen, the, she, she mentioned that we've seen other countries that were halfway through. We never know what happened. How did they attach the report? How did they feel it? What were the challenges? We wouldn't know, but they are there. Um, and environmental tools, can we use them to do a conclusive, a conclusive analysis? That's what you mean. It helps. It greatly helps you to, to, to logically conclude on whatever research you are doing. It depends on which facet are you looking at. Um, and, and what relevance does it have in that, at that point of time? But it's not definitely very confusing, but it helps a great deal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, the, the question was, is there a formal process on, on, on how we implement this? The answer would be yes. Uh, the first thing we, we, we did is to align uh, this work uh, of uh, reporting and implementing environmental involvement agreement with our national environment policy. So, uh, starting from the vision we had, which was uh, ending in 2020, the first uh, national vision for Rwanda. Well, the Rwanda we want, 
we, we are in the process of going for uh, the one I want, but <coughs> I want uh, 50. But then, from there, we went down to look at uh, the midterm implementation strategies. What are the key performance indicators in terms of environment uh, dimensions? And then these environment, manufacturing environment elements inform those key performance indicators in terms of reporting. I'll give you an example that before we put to IPCC these <coughs> communication plans, we do, two years before, we do what we call national meetings uh, to develop a state of uh, environment report, which helps us to feed into the IPCC and, and as international reporting obligations. So there is a process, a formal process that we do this. And, uh, maybe I can share some of the work. We'll, we'll conclude here, but let me just um, summarize a little bit. I think there's this process of reporting, implementation, and effectiveness. And so what we have been looking at is the reports as the tool, right? From in academia, what do we, we've all been students, you always have to turn in an assignment, a homework. If you don't turn that in, you know your grade will be low, but if you turn it in, your grade can still be low, or it can be high. And so what we have used here, the national implement, the national reports, are just the tools to assess what is the level of implementation. And so we are not assessing whether countries are reporting or not. We are assessing what is in those reports. And Every country is reporting its own data. It is not that we, we are testing it uh, for, as an external source. The ultimate goal is to be able to put that on, online, that, that score of your grade, basically, that's from, from zero to five or from A to F, a grade, and then enable NGOs, academics, citizen scientists to look and say, my country is saying, that they're implementing CITES or that they're implementing the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. I know that there are problems. And then you have a tool to actually go and seek redress in, of, of that. And so in this day and age, making that information public, making it available, making it consumable to a lot more people is what is really powerful. And perhaps the most important lesson that we have learned is that there is no fear among governments that oh, we don't want to be tested. And this is why we have really appreciated working with the government of Rwanda. As Peter was saying, we know we have a long way to go, but we are ready to hear where we stand. And Minister Biruta was, was very brave in saying, just tell me where we are and make me an app for that. I want to see an app and knowing how are we reporting, how are we performing, and how can we improve. And where I think that we as an international community can really make a difference is by enabling these conversations to happen. And so this, the Eye on Earth Symposium, is that platform where we could have the discussion. And then Rwanda has actually offered to host African countries, or least developed countries, or whatever countries are interested in come and share information about how are you reporting, how are you implementing, how is that then addressing <coughs> the problems on the ground, and what can we learn from each other. So this is the, the initiative that we have undertaken, this is the, the broader effort, and uh, I'm very happy to, to see and to uh, show to, to you here our national partner, the international partner, and now this academic uh, network of, of institutions, and I'd like you to, I'd like to invite you to, to join us in uh, in this effort to improve uh, implementation and ultimately the effectiveness of these global governance instruments. Thank you for joining us. Today.